Boris Johnson has written in the Daily Telegraph, um, or he, he didn't actually write in the Daily Telegraph, he was interviewed in the Daily Telegraph, um, saying that he favoured a, um, uh, a referendum uh, on the European Convention on Human Rights, um, because it, he thinks that it doesn't uphold um, the uh, and doesn't protect your rights in any meaningful way. Um, I've forgotten the exact quote from uh, from Boris Johnson. Um, he said, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, that's it. It's, um, uh, it doesn't provide people with the protections that they would otherwise have, um, and he's calling for a referendum on it. Um, I think that there's a couple of things that are worth uh, covering just to start with. Um, so the ECHR, people, people always talk about the ECHR without kind of going into a little bit about what it is. So I just want to do that before we, before we start. So the ECHR, um, the, uh, when we're talking about the European Convention on Human Rights, that's abbreviated to ECHR. When you're talking about the European Court of Human Rights, you abbreviate it e, uh, capital E, capital C, lowercase t, HR. So that's usually the, the, the way that, uh, but this is also not to be confused with the EHRC. I don't think that the EHRC should have been allowed to be named the way it was. The EHRC is the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, the one that was uh, set up by, I think it was set up by the Conservatives, um, was very critical of, of um, Corbyn's Labour. Um, and then it turned out that it was caught up in a whole bunch of transphobia and other issues where the people inside it were like, yeah, we don't really think that the people running this are interested in human rights or equality at all. Um, yeah, I know. Um, uh, the uh, the European Court of Human Rights and the European uh, Convention of Human Rights um, were set up, of course, by the Council of Europe, um, the, uh, the the um, nine or so countries that, that formed the Council of Europe, um, and it now has around 30 or 40 members. Um, and the basic principle of the Convention and the Court is for when your country has failed to uphold your human rights, um, they can be protected under this convention. Um, you, the, the way it works is um, if I feel that my rights um, haven't been protected inside my own country and by the legal system of my own country, um, and I have exhausted all avenues, that's really important, within my country, I can make an application which will then be handed either to a single judge, if, usually if it's being rejected, um, a committee of three judges, if it's a relatively simple case, or a chamber of seven to 17 judges, and this will all depend upon the admissibility and complications of these cases. Um, in the past 10 years before 2022, um, the UK only heard eight cases. Um, sorry, the ECHR only heard eight UK cases um, which concerned expulsion or extradition. So any to do with immigration. Um, and there's been a slight bump in recent years. So I think it's worth asking str straight off the bat, why else might these politicians want to withdraw? Because clearly yeah. it's not having that much impact on immigration. Oh, that question was directed at me. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it was part of a continued uh, rant. Oh, no, uh, no, no, no. You can, um, you can, you can, yeah, jump in. Yeah, jump in. What, yeah, what frustrates me about this whole rhetoric is that you can very quickly Google and check how many people we deported last year. About 7,000 without any issues whatsoever. So they're not interfering in our deportations. The only time they do in any way, as Q pointed out, there's been very few cases that have actually made it to the ECHR, which are anything related to deportations in any way. And guess what? Many of them are actually denied but they don't make it onto the front page of the Daily Mail. People have tried. I think the last case, if I remember correctly, when I checked just a few days ago, I went onto the ECHR's website. It was a case where a uh, Pakistani man tried to go to the ECHR because he was going to be deported. He applied and he got denied and he got deported. Um, they've only ever interfered in a very, not even interfered, they've only taken part, interfered is the wrong word, they've only taken part in a, in very few cases, and actually most of the cases, they actually agree with the deportation. Very few people are saved by the ECHR. Um, and it's very frustrating. Um, on top of that, uh, the ECHR also dictates that um, we can... Um, uh, I don't think the correct word is custody, but basically we can essentially put people into a place um, while they're waiting for their asylum application to go through. It is up to us, and somebody pointed this out in the comments, if we let them work or not. So if we've got you know anything from over the last few years as low as 30,000 up to 70,000 applications for asylum in the UK... We've got over a million job vacancies. Some of these people are skilled. Uh, they can speak English absolutely fine. Um, and they're ready to work. 
we know that people who come to this country and have emigrated here have a lower unemployment rate than people who are native to this country, which is the technical word used. I hate that word though, native. Um, native to this country, native born, whatever. Um, they claim less benefits than a person who is born in this country. Uh, these people are ready to work. They want to work. Let them work. If they want to come here and claim asylum and they want to work, let them. Then they can subsidize themselves while they're here because they would want nothing more than to earn money for themselves, for their family, uh, than live off of our state. And it's not because I wouldn't want to give them that money because it's very little money that we actually give them when they're actually here waiting in a hotel for sometimes years at a time. They want to work. Let them do it. And it would get rid of this argument about how much we're spending on... Uh, asylum applications and putting people in hotels and it would also bring more taxpayers into the country it would alleviate so many systems uh, which they are putting very small burdens on right now but still a small burden which could be alleviated um, it is our own laws uh, and our own systems which add this burden which are actually nothing to do with the echr in any way it's just it's just another scapegoat and I'd hope that if there is a position in five years where somehow a more right-wing coalition comes into power, that the UK public are still traumatised enough from Brexit to not vote to leave the ECHR. Because it would be so damaging, so destabilising in so many ways, let alone how it would affect things like the Good Friday Agreement. I don't know if you remember, I may be on a bit of a rant right now, um, Cog, you might be better at this side of history than me, but um, when Rishi Sunak was trying to negotiate that new agreement with the EU, with the Irish border sea, whatever it was called, we literally saw um, a new resurgence of the quote unquote new IRA just because the talks were going on, because they weren't happy that there might be a harder border. They literally came out, if I remember correctly, they killed a police officer, if I remember correctly, at his child's football event. Um, and that was just in talks. Can we imagine what devastation we would throw this country into and Ireland um, by leaving the ECHR? That's just one secondary effect that the new IRA could uh, revitalize. You know, we had the troubles for how many decades, which killed, I think, around 4,000 people, uh, police officers, military personnel, civilians, cars getting blown up in streets, hotels being bombed. Um, and that's just one, one secondary effect of potentially leaving the ACHR, which should scare everybody to shit. Um, mm. And there are so many more secondary effects of what could happen if we leave the ACHR. That's just the one that immediately comes to mind as well. Yeah, the Good Friday Agreement is um, uh, the, the border stuff is quite interesting because it's um, uh, understanding the, the nature of the Irish border being both a, a hard and a soft border at the same time. Um, is uh, you know one that's like a um, for political symbolism reasons is a is a, a hard border, but to protect the interests of both of a united Ireland um, is also a soft border. Um, is is one that's you know it's it's really important to understand that the movement between across that border um, is part of what uh, you know makes it work. Um, and in order to have movement, you need to have um, uh, alignment in terms of uh, legality and litigation. Uh, you can't have um, you can't have too much um, uh, separation, um, and of course, like you say, um, creating a situation where the uh, UK was outside the um, the European uh, Convention on Human Rights and the um, uh, the Irish were were in it does immediately create problems. Um, I did want to talk about um, just briefly some uh, some positive cases um, of ECHR because I think. Again, I'm an advocate for the ECHR. Yeah. I want to put the case forward. Um, I don't think we should be given a referendum on it because I think it's too, one, I think it's too important. Two, our system, our parliamentary system is not set up for referendums. Uh, referendums are um, damaging in so many ways because they are the, um, the the vote of the dictator, right? They're the, they're the vote where you make a choice and you can't go back on it. Um, and I think that is quite damaging unless you have like periodical um, referenda every five, ten years to see if you want to go back into the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Um, but I think the Brexiteers will still be uh, saying that you lost the 2016 referendum in uh, 2050. You know, that they're not going to be letting that one go. Um, but I think the uh, some of the cases that spring to mind that people might be interested in um, are the uh, Smith and Grady versus the UK case. 
um, which essentially protected LGBT people's right to serve in the military. Now, of course, we have a shortage of people in the military. We need as many people in the military as we can. Beneficial to Britain, like undoubtedly, right? Um, you've got uh, a weeder versus the UK, um, where a group of Christians were protecting their religious, um, their their freedom of religious expression at work. Something that I thought that like the UKIPers and the uh, the reform lot would have been well behind, right? Protecting British. Was that the airline case Christian. with the woman who wanted to wear the cross? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I think yeah. we're thinking of the same ones because uh, yeah, it was specifically about wearing a, a cross. Yeah. Um, uh, you've got um, Gillian and um, Quinton versus the UK, which was about the arbitrary use of stop and search powers uh, to violate pro uh, protesters' privacy. Um, now, if you didn't, if you didn't have those protections, by the way, I'm listing cases that have been won. Um, if you didn't have those protections, how much easier would it be to intimidate pro-Palestine protesters? Um, yeah. If you're in a situation where you don't like Keir Starmer, which is, I'm aware, the majority of the UK right now, it's not in your well, interest. Well, it's apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like it's like not in your interest to be leaving a court that will uphold your right to protest. Your right to protest, as much as you might want to poo-poo protesters for, I can't believe I just said that. As much as you might want to shit on protesters for upholding, um, uh, for for uh, holding up traffic or being a pain or being a nuisance or being too left-wing, you really should think because you might be the people who need to be protesting in the next few years and months, like. I know it's primarily a thing that the left do, but there are right wing groups that protest, particularly like when we're talking about um, over uh, changes to tax reform or fox hunting. There's various fox hunting groups that do a lot of protesting, um, you know, uh, uh, taxpayers alliance rights and things like that. Um, the other one that I think is really significant, particularly we have an aging population and an aging voter base um, is McDonald versus the UK, which was about inadequate care being provided to for an elderly woman in a care home. Um, she wasn't getting protection from the UK courts. She'd um, exhausted her um, her protections in terms of uh, the, the UK courts. So she had to go to the ECHR and the ECHR said, yep, you can't do that. You have to provide better care for her, um, which I hope all of us would want uh, going forward. So I like my understanding of it is basically that it just get worse for everybody involved um, leaving the, the European Court of Human Rights. But also, I tried to pick out cases when I was I was researching those cases that I would have thought that the right wing elderly Christians um, who are interested in protesting Keir Starmer and care about the military would be interested in, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what people don't realise, to boil it down really simply, is that Every time the ECHR has ruled in the favour um, of a person over the government means that that government tried to breach your human rights. So every case that has ever gone forward to the ECHR and they've agreed with that person, that is the moment that the government tried to infringe on your rights. It's an example of why the court needs to exist. You know, the, the only way I would ever leave the ECHR is if we went over to a more higher, more protected constitutional system. I wouldn't necessarily see like be like, oh, that's the reason we have to do it. That's the only compromise I would ever want to make. And it'd be like what uh, somebody said just slightly earlier about, uh, yeah, double D, about referendums being 60%. I want constitutional reform. I'm fed up of being one of the only countries in the world that has like a um, uncodified constitution. Brexit should have never happened because fundamentally most countries accept that through their democratic system that a gust of wind on a particular issue can change people's minds on things and fundamentally damage them just because there's a 50-50 threshold. The way a country works should only be able to be changed whether it's you know through whether it's something that's to do with like the voting systems, to do with uh, the, the infrastructure of an entire country and how it functions should only ever be able to pass at a higher threshold. Most countries in the world do this. Like, even in America, right? Not the greatest example. They're a mess. <laughs> but, you know, you have to have two thirds to change the constitution. I wouldn't vote for something that high. I think 60% is a nice number. But going back to someone mentioning as well, people having ba uh, ballot initiatives, uh, Jacqueline here, that's great because for other things, yeah, we can have a 50-50, right? If people wanted to, I don't know, legalize marijuana, 50-50, I'm happy with that. If, some, if people want to, you know, ban fox hunting properly, 
50-50 perhaps. But when it comes to the infrastructure of and how an entire country functions, something that's going to fundamentally change everything in any way, and things that are directly related to human rights should be sealed away on a higher threshold other than 50%, because look where we are. A gust of the wind changed everything. And now we know a lot of those people are dead, are dead now who voted for Brexit, and a lot of those people have changed their minds. So... We're stuck with this mess because of this lovely centrist government who will refuse to engage um, in any talks about ever joining even aspects of the European Union, never mind the European Union itself, even though it yeah. would help. But anyway, I wanted to rant draw, over. Yeah, I wanted to just draw attention to the, uh, the comment um, from Rachel, like, let the bodies pile high. Yeah, what would these people get away with if they could? Um, but also uh, the comment from Jacqueline again, um, sorry to keep bringing your, your uh, comments up, um, but not being cynical, but perhaps there are people who are hoping that the elderly are too cognitively declined or seen to notice what their standard of care is. And I actually think if <laughs> the, the thing is, the Tories have got the, the elderly in a in a uh, in a vice grip right now because they yeah. control their reading. Right. The, the right wing control what they're reading. They control what you know, they go to their newspaper for the news. And mm. it provides them a great big pile of shit about how immigrants are ruining the country, so they need to vote for the right wing parties, or um, well, they need to vote for parties that are anti immigration. Um, meanwhile, uh, the like all of the parties, whether it's the Tories failing the uh, the pensioners on um, you know li um, under Liz Truss and protecting their pensions um, in terms of their economic plans, or whether it's the Tories like um, uh, just mm. completely disregarding them with the let the bodies pile high comments. That's the elderly. That's who 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 you know that. Those are whose bodies were going to pile high because they were statistically the most vulnerable. Um, and then you've got like Labour introducing the winter fuel cap. Somebody does need to stick up for the elderly. Um, and I'd rather it wasn't the Reform Party that that took on those uh, those votes. Um, and I think we you need to. I'm going to be I'm going to be controversial because oh, no. I do very much take the side of. Um, there are a lot of pensioners who are doing just fine. I believe in the means testing, which I don't think is actually quite unpopular, especially with a lot of people on the left. We accept that uh, means testing is absolutely fine for the winter fuel payments. Obviously, there's an argument about where the threshold should be. I think that's very fair. But a lot of pensioners are just fine. Um, and if you actually look at people who are retired and how the percentage of those people who own their home and the average pension income that they have, they're doing fine compared to many other groups of people and um, this like constant appeal to pensioners not only because they're retired they're not really many of them most of them aren't actually paying any tax anymore because obviously they live just around that threshold usually if it's like a two-person household they usually live around that bringing in about twelve thousand pounds a year each kind of threshold when you include their private pensions when you include their um not the government pensions what's the correct word i'm looking for not the called government pension it's called Oh, the public uh, public sector pension. Um, yeah, whatever it's uh, called. Yeah. There are other groups of people out there who need more help now. I'm sorry that we have to cater to pensioners because they're the biggest voter group, but many of them are fine. And a lot of these pensioners have now dragged this country through the bush by keeping the Tories in power, by voting for Brexit. And I'm sorry, and many of them have ruined this country. Many of them are voting against their best intentions because the workforce that we need to bring into this country, as somebody brought up in the comments, uh, are carers. We can't train enough of them. People don't want to do that work and we need to bring them over here. But those people want to vote against those people coming over here um they, they, they've low they've lowered the amount of people who can come here and work um through the systems that they've created and that they voted for um while they sit a majority of pensioners sit in their house that's been paid off for years um and uh, they continue to vote against their best interests. And it's absolutely frustrating. And I'm fed up of everyone having such emotive feelings towards uh, those groups of pensioners. Now, side note, there is a group of pensioners out there who are not as privileged as those other pensioners. And they do need help. And they are getting it. They're keeping their winter fuel payments. I would argue that the threshold should be slightly higher because when it comes to those thresholds, we're not taking that much into certain regional aspects as well. Um, when I, you know, growing up in Leeds, the cost of a house in Leeds versus Bradford just a few miles away can be, you know, starkly different. The rent can be twice as high in Leeds as it would be in Bradford, but the, you know, the benefits that you would get off the government are the same, which is unfair. And we should help those people who need the extra help. But 
there are other groups of people in this country who are now suffering and will suffer more in the future because of the current circumstances than pensioners are suffering now. And I'm fed up of having to appeal to them. And I'm not sorry for it. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've got a bit of sympathy <laughs> with the idea that we shouldn't be like appealing to pensioners, but I think we really should be protecting them. Um, I, don't, I don't think you, you really disagree with that idea, to be honest. Um, but I think that the problem with the means test um, is, uh, for one thing, it's it's more expensive than just taxing. Uh, we, we already have a, a system for targeting the, the richest in our society. It's taxation. Like We, we already have a system that could, uh, that, that could actually target um, uh, the, the very richest. Um, the problem is like a lot of the uh, pensioners don't know they can claim pension credit. The form is massively long. Uh, a lot of pensioners are um, uh, falling behind in the technology gap. And it's true that 25% of pensioners are millionaires, but that's in asset wealth, right? Which is really hard to translate into uh, liquid wealth. It can't be um, very easily really from downgrade. The, <laughs> the, uh, the, well, the thing is, is like a lot of, you know, there's an argument for them downgrading, but then after they're downgraded, what do they do? Because like once that, once that wealth is gone, and in terms of like the care that is required by somebody, and once they've uh, made their, their assets liquid, um, the amount that it can uh, that the um, uh, state can impose um, uh, taxes on them and uh, can can argue well you you pay above a th certain threshold for this uh, care home because you earn above a certain threshold we're not going to protect you you have hundreds of thousands of pounds in the bank because you've you've uh, you know liquidized your 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 house your, your assets um, so we're not going to protect you you know you, you frankly you can uh, yeah you can keep keep paying out. Um, so a lot of pensioners and a lot of pensioners, of course, are, are stubborn, as you would be. They want to maintain their autonomy. It's something that's really important in um, uh, in terms of uh, gerontology, some, the, the study of aging and, um, uh, and and keeping people comfort in old age. Um, it is really important that people like maintain their autonomy. It's important that we um, we make sure that it's it's targeted. And um, I do think that although people have been appealing to pensioners, they've been appealing to what the right-wing media have told pensioners their interests uh, their interests their interests are which is appealing to um you know the uh, the anti-migrant rhetoric because no one's too smart to fall for propaganda that's never true right no no one if all you're being given in terms of information is immigrants are the problem you're going to think that immigrants are the problem you're going to vote in a way that reflects that um the problems come um when you've actually got real interests that need to be looked out for like heating your homes in the winter, like um, making sure that you retain your autonomy, like the costs of care. Um, and when you've like been told to ignore all of those, those things in terms of immigration, somebody has to step in and, and the Tories aren't going to do it. Labour clearly aren't going to do it. Um, do reform step in and do it? I don't think so. I don't think re reform care enough. Um, I think they're too interested in looking after the fossil fuel industry, who, of course, massively benefit from non-insulated homes. Um, so I do think we need somebody uh, like a, a, a portion of the left that will take a gerontological approach, that will take a, an approach that analyzes the conditions for elderly people and makes an appeal to them. Um, but in a way that actually benefits them rather than just like, oh, you're anti-immigration. OK, well, we, we will bash migrants even harder than the conservatives will. And it's like that's not actually helping pensioners. Uh, yeah, so like I, I agree with your frustrations, um, but like I yeah, it's like just coming at them from a slightly different angle, I guess. No, I was just laughing at this comment. <laughs> Gen X gave the, the world eighties music and Thatcherism. What's not to like about never-ending neoliberal hell? <laughs> um, oh. I think yeah, I accept that people can fall for propaganda, and anybody can fall for it, regardless of uh, you know levels of intelligence or background. But there is still a level of personal responsibility that people need to take on, and I feel like um, we've got a group of people who have seen perhaps their standard of living decline and have fallen for that propaganda, but are ultimately voting against their best interest. And I don't know how to fix that. Um, but I think one method, perhaps, just maybe, could be people taking on the positive immigration conversation, right? Just a little bit better. Uh, but no one's willing to do it because they're so scared of having that conversation about saying how good it is, the benefits that it brings to the country, which, by the way, is tens and tens and tens of billions of pounds uh, to our country every year. 
um, um, we're actually subsidized. Our NHS is subsidized by migrants right now because every time a migrant comes over, we're not talking about the boats, we're talking about the people who come over on visas, they have to pay a surcharge fee to the NHS. And all the data shows is that they use, they almost never use the NHS, those people, especially in the first few years of being here where they have to keep renewing that surcharge. So they're actually subsidizing our NHS care because they don't use it. There's so many benefits to bringing people over, increasing the tax burden, uh, sorry, spreading out the tax burden. Um, so many good reasons to bring people over, but no one's willing to have that conversation. Um, mm. We know, uh, I'm pretty sure, that there is still no evidence of any Western countries who've been able to increase their population size. Um, sorry, re sorry, reverse the trend that's currently happening in regards to people having babies, which I still think is a shit conversation anyway, because by having these conversations, we are still playing into that capitalist system of never-ending growth. We have to increase the population. We have to do this because it's the way every system works. And uh, who's going to take care of the old people? And how's the economy going to grow? And that's, a, again, a big part of the problem that we need to tackle of we have to play into the system of, oh, we need more people. Um, and if not, we need more people having babies, but ultimately it's all because we need to keep the system going, uh, the never-ending system of growth, which is eventually, you know, going to get to a point where it's just going to collapse, ultimately. At some point, it has to, right? Like, we can't just keep going, uh, mm. but we're all a victim to it anyway. But, yeah, that's a whole other rant that I could go on for a very long time for. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, uh, my pal for maybe we should uh, look to appealing to those who are politically disenfranchised and the elderly or the Tory voters. The call guide is for a few minutes. That. I'll let you have that one. Yeah, no, no, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Totally agree. Um, I think that there are so many groups that we need to appeal to um, along the lines of the idea that they are uh, vulnerable. Um, I just think. Um, uh, the way that, um, say, the LGBT community, um, uh, the way that young people, the way that um, uh, the black community in the UK, um, the way that the Muslim community in the UK, the way that these people are vulnerable is different to the way that elderly people are vulnerable, but elderly people are still a vulnerable group. Um, and we should be careful about dismissing their interests and rights, given that we're a population that's going to be, because of our, our kind of lopsided population tree, um, we're going to be one day in that demographic where we're going to be relying on a smaller number of young people um, statistically to give us care or to care for our parents. Um, and frankly, we should make sure that we're protecting those people. That's all I'm uh, saying, you know, uh, do, do make an, um, even if they don't vote for you, just make an appeal to protect those people um, because, you know, you're not necessarily looking to have them, them vote for you if you can. That's great. Um, but it's more about just protecting them as humans than, than necessarily appealing to their vote. Um, yeah, um, I, I don't want uh, Lewis's, um, uh, the, the system is doomed uh, to, to be the thing we end on. Because <laughs> I don't want it to be that. No, no, I, I just want to make one point about the, 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 the comment that's highlighted right now is that Labour have lost their chance to get back, the, either get back the left or activate more people on the left. You know, one plan that they have is to auto-enroll voters, which, you know, in theory could help them in the future. Um, however, you know, I think after the damage that they've done with uh, Palestine, the damage that they've done with purging the left, the damage that they've done with the child benefit cap, um, who knows what austerity is coming uh, with the budget, uh, which is when again, Cog, sorry, end of October? Uh, yeah, 30th, isn't it? 30th? Yeah. Oh. Um, Death they, I don't know what groups they could access that they haven't either pissed off or wouldn't be able to get to because they've already disenfranchised massive parts of the left. And are they going to go for the, what, the disenfranchised center? Is that even a thing? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know who they could go after. Yeah. Yeah. Um... That's very... oh, sorry, well, I'm talking about Labour, but obviously the comment was about who we should be appealing to, but I'm just using it as an, in, in essence of uh, Labour, because mm. we, don't, we don't really stand behind any particular party here at Turn Left. Support independent media, support social justice that's there on social media. Thank you, Turn Left.